Earlier this year, SNL debuted a fake movie trailer for a dark, gritty reimagining of Mario Kart, lampooning the success of HBO's The Last of Us. The sketch was well-received amongst fans of the Mario series, who praised it for its similarities to the games, but also for what it did differently. But if you're like me, this fake trailer only served as a reminder of a real movie. One that also took a light-hearted Mario video game and turned it into a dark, gritty, post-apocalyptic nightmare. Only this one was not well-received by, well, anyone. It takes a lot more imagination <laughs> than what's been attempted with Super Mario Brothers to make a high-tech movie transfer. But it's a complete waste of time and money. It is. It's yeah! I'm talking about the original Super Mario Brothers movie. How many Marios are there between the two of you? There's three. There's, there's Mario Mario and Luigi Mario. Now before you arm yourselves with torches and pitchforks, I of course understand the difference between a three-minute sketch and a full-length feature film. I also acknowledge that this movie is not without its problems, most notably an inconsistent plot and a music score that's incredibly out of place. While I faced criticism for being a visually repulsive film, that was one element that I loved as a kid. I mean, this was an era when we baked bugs in a creepy crawler maker, enjoyed watching kids get drenched in slime, and played a board game that revolved around picking a guy's nose. And yet, here was a kid's movie that was completely unafraid to be menacing and downright gross in its themes, but one that also had a sense of humor about how utterly ridiculous it was conceptually. It wasn't your driving that just saved us. That tunnel just sneezed us out, and then this giant booger caught us in there. That's what saved us. Oh, come on! Even looking back 30 years later, I still have to praise the movie for committing to its dark theme. Hey, listen, if we're gonna eat this place, we're gonna have to be very, very hungry. Excuse me. The Super Mario Brothers Super Show, which was a much lighter adaptation of the games, had aired just four years prior. So I can understand why they went as dark as they did with the movie. It gave it an edge that was needed to set the movie apart from this. What do you mean, speakerphone? I fixed it special. Just push the third pepperoni from the right. Mario Brothers Plumbing, you block them, we clear them. Plumbers. On top of that, the sets were huge and immersive. The effects and animatronics were really impressive, for the most part. <laughs> and the cast was just great. In particular, Bob Hoskins, who somehow managed to embody exactly the type of person I imagined Mario would be in real life, despite not being Italian or from Brooklyn. It wasn't until years later when the first wave of internet movie critics hit YouTube that I discovered just how hated this movie was. And in fairness to this movie's detractors, I can understand why it's disliked. We've all heard of the stories of its nightmarish production, one that left stars Bob Hoskins and John Leguizamo getting drunk in between scenes. I didn't even know it was a guy. It was my kids that told me. Well, I said, what's your next film? I'm doing Super Mario Brothers. Oh, that's the game. Oh, what? Yeah, here. And this is you! And I saw this thing jumping up and down, and I thought, I used to play King Rhea. I mean, you can tell from any production photo how much fun they were having on set. SHUT UP! Most of the problems from the movie seem to stem from a total lack of communication between the film's producers, directors, and cast. In addition to its inconsistencies, it also takes plenty of liberties with its source material, and isn't a very faithful adaptation. But honestly, was anyone expecting it to be? It'd be impossible to turn these early Mario games into a cohesive film narrative without taking some chances. Quite an agreeable transmogrification. More like a um, transfiguration. Ah, a simple metamorphosis. Hmm. Huh? And for the most part, the liberties that are taken are pretty inventive. Get him on, suckers! I need Koopa coins, you lighthouse! The movie might not feel like Mario Brothers, but you know what? Neither does this. <laughs> <laughs> Shut up! And when you strip away the more bizarre liberties taken, what remains is an adaptation that still manages to pay homage to the games. It's still a story about a red-clad, mustachioed Brooklyn plumber, and his brother being sucked into a different dimension, where they must save a princess from a reptilian-like king. Larry Lazard of Lazard Lazard, Conda, Dactyl, and Cohen sometimes even jumping in a way that isn't humanly possible. The movie's critical and commercial failure caused Nintendo to refuse to license their properties to film studios for 30 years. A harsh punishment for a movie that's really not that bad. 
But with Nintendo finally allowing their properties to be adapted to film again, and a new Super Mario Bros. movie releasing in just weeks, I want to take a look back at this surreal yet intriguing movie, one in which the production is far more interesting than anything that happens on screen. Strap your bone on, kid. We're going in. More recently, it seems fans of this movie have become more vocal in defending it, with one passionate group of fans called Super Mario Bros. The Movie Archive even working to release the original extended cut of the movie. This video would not be possible without the extensive research and interviews they have done on this movie, and I highly encourage checking out their site to learn more. To talk about Super Mario Bros. The Movie, we first have to talk about a movie that changed the way these adaptations were made, Batman 1989. This movie gave way to a whole subgenre of movies, ones that took comic source material and turned them into unapologetically dark films. While most of these movies tried to recreate the success of Batman, they also dared to be different in their own individual ways. Each of them were marketing behemoths as well, changing the way kids' movies were marketed forever. Hey kids, I'm here to tell you about two extremely famous corners, Mario Mario and Luigi Mario. British producer Roland Joffe saw an opportunity in this. In a move that seems impossible to comprehend today, Roland approached Nintendo directly and secured the film rights to the Mario character independently of a major studio, in exchange for allowing Nintendo to keep the merchandising rights. Where the real money from the movie is made. Jaffe spent the next two years receiving pitches for the movie, totaling six screenplays with over seven figures spent on pre-production alone. Each new draft seemed to incorporate elements from the previous draft, muddying the story and leading to plot inconsistencies. For instance, early drafts had the film set in the Mushroom Kingdom, while later drafts were set in the dinosaur land of Super Mario World. Elements were pillaged from each version, resulting in a movie that tries to tie both mushrooms and dinosaurs into the same world. Hey, Mario, did you see that? What? Well, he's trying to communicate. Luigi, it's a mushroom. The first script, which was completed in 1991, feels more like a big screen adaptation of the Super Show than the movie we ended up getting. If you're curious to what a lighter comedic version of this movie would have looked like, just look at what the writers of this draft wrote next. Yeah, but... Here's a scene from this original screenplay shortly after Mario and Luigi arrived in the Mushroom Kingdom. Warily, Mario and Luigi enter the shot, catching sight of Toad, their mouths drop in unison. Mario, it's a... a talking mushroom. Toad, he swings, dodging the snapping jaws. I am not a mushroom. Eek. I'm a toadstool. Ah! And in case you hadn't noticed, ah! I'm gonna be lunch meat. I got it. I know where we are now. This has gotta be some kind of nuclear waste theme park. You know, like Mutant World or something. Excuse me, a little help here? Luigi steps over and stops the metronome from rocking. Their prey out of reach, the piranha plants descend into the pipes. Thank you. The release pin is up there. Luigi goes up to pull the release pin above the ankle collar, but Mario stops him. To Toad. You know the way back to Brooklyn from here? You're lost? I'd be glad to guide you home, but it's kind of hard giving directions when I'm hanging upside down. He's got a point, Mario. One thing incorporated from this draft into all the ones that followed was the idea of Mario as the older reluctant hero, with Luigi being the younger dreamer in pursuit of the princess. Right now, a miraculous world, this guy just found out that he was in another dimension. The only thing miraculous I know is that we're still eating. Though Harold Ramis was originally pursued as director, Joffe eventually settled on Max Headroom creators Annabelle Jankel and Rocky Morton. Max Headroom perfectly captured the tone that Roland envisioned for his Mario movie. The two signed on to direct a revised script by Dick Clement and Ian Lafrenet. This latest draft drew inspiration from Mad Max, and was even set to include an epic Mario Kart action sequence midway through. This draft was used to secure a main cast as well, with Bob Hoskins and John Leguizamo signing on after reading it. Are we dead? Agreeing that the movie should have a dystopian feel, David Snyder was hired as production designer. Snyder had previously designed the worlds in Blade Runner and Bill and Ted's Bogus Journey. And I don't care what anyone says, but the production design for this movie still deserves praise even today. Dino Hatton, as this parallel dimension was called, feels so lived in and developed. I don't know, maybe we got knocked unconscious for a hundred years and woke up in Manhattan of the future. Maybe the Bronx is the day. No wonder they tell you never to come up here. It's packed full of intricate detail and characters that you probably have missed unless you've viewed this film multiple times. Snyder was given a massive abandoned concrete plant in Wilmington, North Carolina to create his world. The set stretched multiple stories, and is far bigger than something that could have been built in a soundstage. 
It's really impressive when we cut to Koopa's tower and we can see the immersive street set below it through the windows. You can tell that's really there and not added in in post. To design the eclectic group of creatures seen in the movie, Patrick Tatopoulos was brought on board to lead a design, having just finished working with Francis Ford Coppola on Bram Stoker's Dracula. The intricacy of the Yoshi puppet alone required a team of 10 people to operate. The lumbering Goombas are also really impressive and intricately designed. Walk tall! Be proud! Go Goomba! We got pretty excited when the skins were run and the mechanics were going in, and, and you could move the eyebrows and the eyes, and, and all of a sudden, something that was just made out of uh, foam latex and, and aluminum and little pieces of steel and plastic became a real kind of person. I love how some of them have those small round heads while others have a more traditional reptilian one. Stupid! The T-Rex Koopa at the end is also pretty impressive. The budget was quickly ballooning though, and Jaffe sought additional funds by enticing Disney into distributing the film through their Hollywood Pictures label. Wow, we're going broke. We ain't going broke, Mario. We're already there. Screenwriters Ed Solomon and Ryan Rowe were brought in to rewrite the screenplay, unbeknownst to the cast and directors. This new draft, which resembled a more traditional Disney narrative, omitted several elements of the previous script, both for budgetary reasons and to appeal more to Disney. Excluding the Mario Kart action scene being cut, several characters were combined with each other or cut out entirely. Toad, for instance, had a much larger role and was originally written to be a grizzled scavenger who later rescues the Mario Brothers in the desert, with Tom Waits originally saw for the part. Toad's role was combined with the good Goomba character. And he's been de-evolved. That's right, he's been de-evolved into fungus. And the script had Iggy and Spike come to Mario and Luigi's aid later in the movie instead. <laughs> I don't get it. The cast and crew arrived on location in Wilmington, North Carolina to find a different screenplay than the one they had signed on for. Morton and Jankel were furious at the lack of communication and considered leaving the project, but felt they had already invested too much time. They brought in Ed Solomon to rewrite his script during filming, though he eventually left the project and was replaced by two writers who had worked on an earlier draft, Parker Bennett and Terry Runte. The directors were under the expectation that they could reclaim their original vision during production through these rewrites, though in reality, they just steered the story further off track. Elements of the script that once worked were muddled in these rewrites. I got two words for you. Impossible. The directors remained incredibly bitter, and the cast found themselves caught in the middle of a battle between the directors and the producers. While the story faltered as a result, the incredible sets and effects just serve as a reminder of what this film could have been had everyone been on the same page. It's clean and it's dirty at the same time. The cast also serves as a reminder of this. Though on paper, Leguizamo and Hoskins should not work as Mario Brothers, or any brothers really, their chemistry defines the film. Alien species escaping from police detention. Aliens? Oh, we gotta deal with aliens too? Luigi, we're the aliens! We are? Whoa, cool. They make each Mario brother their own, but also manage to feel like real brothers, despite not having any similarities between them. Mario here brought me up. He's been my, my mother my whole life. Hey. <laughs> now I have my father. My father. You know, my father, my uncle, my brother, everybody. Fisher Stevens and Richard Edson are also a lot of fun as Iggy and Spike. I'm Spike. I'm Spike. He's Iggy. I'm Spike. I, I'm, I'm Iggy. I'm Spike. He's Spike. We'll follow in and we'll both go in. Good idea. I bag her, you grab her. No, I grab her, you bag her. That's what I said. Exactly. It's a shame that the Toad character ended up being reduced to this. Any chance of a plate of steamed vegetables? <laughs> but the redemption arc of Iggy and Spike makes for a more interesting third act. A retreat is in order. An ordered retreat. Dennis Hopper gives the most surreal performance as King Koopa. I'm about to lose everything! We can talk about this later, if later even occurs! But most of the inconsistencies in his performance can be attributed to the script. They say they never forget the first time they kissed by a lizard. Oh. He at least seems to be having fun with the part and is giving it his all. Well, you just said you were wrong. An evil, egg-sucking son of a snake. Did I lie? The film continued to evolve after shooting Wrapped as well, with the directors forced to cut out 20 minutes in post. This included a lot of needed exposition, such as expanding on Mario's war with rival Scapelli. Nobody messes with our boss. Our boss, Scapelli. You know? Oh yeah, I know. I grew up with him. He ain't a plumber, he's a toxic waste dumper. He don't know the difference between a pipe and a crowbar. 
This also gave Mario and Luigi a more defined arc. In this extended cut, Luigi had doubts about his family legacy being a plumber, while Mario had resentment towards Luigi for having to raise him. Okay, Mario, okay, it's all my fault, all right? Well, I'm sorry I fell for her. I'm sorry I got feelings and desires. I'm sorry they stabbed us, they fungicized us, choked us, poked us. It's all my fault, Mario. This would have been addressed as the film went on, with Luigi and Mario realizing the importance of family and learning to work together. There's a few remnants left in the final cut that show this, like Mario always lecturing Luigi about the importance of trusting your tools. Ow! You slap! Treat your tools like a friend. Keep them by you. Never let them down, and they're always at your side. This is also why Luigi lacked a mustache. It was his way of rebelling against his family. The opening even showed that their father proudly sported a mustache as well. While other deleted scenes are best left on the cutting room floor, like this rap sequence with Iggy and Spike. When we met two plumbers who had an idea, they showed us the lake and the new frontier. Mario, and Luigi, they know what's right. We gotta take a stand and put up a fight. Shut up! One of the most important arcs of the extended cut, though, is seeing Koopa finally get his pizza. Seriously, when you watch the original movie, you have to expect a payoff. I'd like the Koopa special. Pterodactyl tail on that? Yes. Dino, lizard, hold the mammal. There's so many beats involving this pizza that you really expect it to go somewhere, but it doesn't. Where's my pizza? Kind of like the ending as well. You're never gonna believe this. I believe it. You do? <laughs> I believe. Lastly, an upbeat comedy score was added composed by Alan Silvestri, in the hopes it would give the movie a lighter tone, though it ends up sounding like something straight out of Honey, I Shrunk the Kids. Swing! Keep swinging! I'm swinging! I'm swinging! In a baffling move, none of the Mario game themes would be used in the film, aside from the opening five seconds. I mean, wouldn't the ending have been so much better if it had been scored like this? Despite a huge marketing push and a Memorial Day weekend release date, Super Mario Bros. opened at number 4, and bad word of mouth led to it slipping further and further into obscurity. It ended up on many worst of the year lists, and became one of the most notorious film failures of all time. Today, it's nearly impossible to find, not being available to rent or own on any streaming platform, and pretty much out of print in the US. But isn't that all a little harsh? Look, it's not a great movie by any means, but there is enough good here that still makes this movie worth coming back to. The craftsmanship and work that went into designing these sets and creatures is something that you really don't see today. It may not feel like the Super Mario games, but that's what sets it apart. Nothing's impossible, Mario. Improbable, unlikely, but never impossible. I hope you're right. As we approach this new era of Nintendo films, which we're bound to get a lot of, it's important not to forget about not only the first Nintendo movie, but the very first video game movie as well. I hope more people learn to trust the fungus and embrace this movie. Trust the fungus. Trust the fungus. Because it's really not that bad. <laughs>